chapter two part two of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter two love versus law part two and now let us pass over all the intermediate pounding and grinding and chopping which for the next week foretold approaching festivity in the kitchen of the deacon let us forbear to provoke the appetite of a hungry reader by setting in order before him the minced pies the cranberry tarts the pumpkin pies the doughnuts the cookies and other sweet cakes of every description that sprang into being at the magic touch of black dinah the village priestess on all these solemnities suffice it to say that the day had arrived and the auspicious quilt was spread the invitation had not failed to include the misses silence and susan jones nay the good deacon had pressed gallantry into the matter so far as to be the bearer of the message himself for which he was duly rewarded by a broadside from miss silence giving him what she termed a piece of her mind in the matter of the rights of widows and orphans to all which the good old man listened with great benignity from the beginning to the end and replied with well well miss silence i expect you will think better of this before long there had best not be any hard words about it so saying he took up his hat and walked off while miss silence who felt extremely relieved by having blown off steam declared that it was of no more use to hector old deacon enos than to fire a gun at a bag of cotton wool for all that though she shouldn't go to the quilting nor more should susan but sister why not said the little maiden i think i shall go and susan said this in a tone so mildly positive that silence was amazed what upon arth ails you susan said she opening her eyes with astonishment haven't you any more spirit than to go to deacon enos's when he is doing all he can to ruin us i like deacon enos replied susan he was always kind to me when i was a little girl and i'm not going to believe that he is a bad man now when a young lady states that she is not going to believe a thing good judges of human nature generally give up the case but miss silence to whom the language of opposition and argument was entirely new could scarcely give her ears credit for veracity in the case she therefore repeated over exactly what she said before only in a much louder tone of voice and with much more vehement forms of asseveration a mode of reasoning which if not strictly logical has at least the sanction of very respectable authorities among the enlightened and learned silence replied susan when the storm had spent itself if it did not look like being angry with deacon enos i would stay away to oblige you but it would seem to every one to be taking sides in a quarrel and i never did and never will have any part or lot in such things then you'll just be trod and trampled on all your days susan replied silence but however if you choose to make a fool of yourself i don't and so saying she flounced out of the room in great wrath it so happened however that miss silence was one of those who have so little economy in disposing of a fit of anger that it was all used up before the time of execution arrived it followed of consequence that having unburdened her mind freely both to deacon enos and to susan she began to feel very much more comfortable and good-natured and consequent upon that came divers reflections upon the many gossiping opportunities and comforts of a quilting and then the intrusive little reflection what if she should go after all what harm would be done and then the inquiry whether it was not her duty to go and look after susan poor child who had no mother to watch over her in short before the time of preparation arrived miss silence had fully worked herself up to the magnanimous determination of going to the quilting 
accordingly the next day while susan was standing before her mirror braiding up her pretty hair she was startled by the apparition of miss silence coming into the room as stiff as a changeable silk and a high horn comb could make her and grimly determined was her look well susan said she if you will go to the quilting this afternoon i think it is my duty to go and see to you what would people do if this convenient shelter of duty did not afford them a retreat in cases when they are disposed to change their minds susan suppressed the arch smile that in spite of herself laughed out at the corners of her eyes and told her sister that she was much obliged to her for her care so off they went together silence in the meantime held forth largely on the importance of standing up for one's rights and not letting one's self be trampled on the afternoon passed on the elderly ladies quilted and talked scandal and the younger ones discussed the merits of the various beaux who were expected to give vivacity to the evening entertainment among these the newly arrived joseph adams just from college with all his literary honours thick about him became a prominent subject of conversation it was duly canvassed whether the young gentleman might be called handsome and the affirmative was carried by a large majority although there were some variations and exceptions one of the party declaring his whiskers to be in too high a state of cultivation another maintaining that they were in the exact line of beauty while a third vigorously disputed the point whether he wore whiskers at all it was allowed by all however that he had been a great beau in the town where he had passed his college days it was also inquired into whether he were matrimonially engaged and the negative being understood they diverted themselves with predicting to one another the capture of such a prize each prophecy being received with such disclaimers as come now do be still hush your nonsense and the like at length the long-wished-for hour arrived and one by one the lords of the creation began to make their appearance and one of the last was this much-admired youth that is joe adams that is he was the busy whisper as a tall well-looking young man came into the room with the easy air of one who had seen several things before and was not to be abashed by the combined blaze of all the village beauties in truth our friend joseph had made the most of his residence in inn paying his court no less to the graces than the muses his fine person his frank manly air his ready conversation and his faculty of universal adaptation had made his society much coveted among the beau monde of inn and though the place was small he had become familiar with much good society we hardly know whether we may venture to tell our fair readers the whole truth in regard to our hero we will merely hint in the gentlest manner in the world that mr joseph adams being undeniably first in the classics and first in the drawing-room having been gravely commended in his class by his venerable president and gaily flattered in the drawing-room by the elegant miss this and miss that was rather inclining to the opinion that he was an uncommonly fine fellow and even had the assurance to think that under present circumstances he could please without making any great effort a thing which however true it were in point of fact is obviously improper to be thought of by a young man be that as it may he moved about from one to another shaking hands with all the old ladies and listening with the greatest affability to the various comments on his growth and personal appearance his points of resemblance to his father mother grandfather and grandmother which are always detected by the superior acumen of elderly females among the younger ones he at once and with full frankness recognized old schoolmates and partners in various whortleberry chestnut and strawberry excursions and thus called out an abundant flow of conversation nevertheless his eye wandered occasionally around the room as if in search of something not there what could it be it kindled however with an expression of sudden brightness as he perceived the tall and spare figure of miss silence 
whether owing to the personal fascinations of that lady or to other causes we leave the reader to determine miss silence had predetermined never to speak a word again to uncle jaw or any of his race but she was taken by surprise at the frank extended hand and friendly how do you do it was not in woman to resist so cordial an address from a handsome young man and miss silence gave her hand and replied with a graciousness that amazed herself at this moment also certain soft blue eyes peeped forth from a corner just to see if he looked as he used to yes there he was the same dark mirthful eyes that used to peer on her from behind the corners of the spelling-book at the district school and susan jones gave a deep sigh to those times and then wondered why she happened to think of such nonsense how is your sister little miss susan said joseph why she is here have you not seen her said silence there she is in that corner joseph looked but could scarcely recognize her there stood a tall slender blooming girl that might have been selected as a specimen of that union of perfect health with delicate fairness so characteristic of the young new england beauty she was engaged in telling some merry story to a knot of young girls and the rich colour that like a bright spirit constantly went and came in her cheeks the dimples quick and varying as those of a little brook the clear mild eye the clustering curls and above all the happy rejoicing smile and the transparent frankness and simplicity of expression which beamed like sunshine about her all formed a combination of charms that took our hero quite by surprise and when silence who had a remarkable degree of directness in all her dealings called out here susan is joe adams inquiring after you our practised young gentleman felt himself colour to the roots of his hair and for a moment he could scarce recollect that first rudiment of manners to make his bow like a good boy susan coloured also but perceiving the confusion of our hero her countenance assumed an expression of mischievous drollery which helped on by the titter of her companions added not a little to his confusion dense take it thought he what's the matter with me and calling up his courage he dashed into the formidable circle of fair ones and began chattering with one and another calling by name with or without introduction remembering things that never happened with a freedom that was perfectly fascinating really how handsome he has grown thought susan and she coloured deeply when once or twice the dark eyes of our hero made the same observation with regard to herself in that quick intelligible dialect which eyes alone can speak and when the little party dispersed as they did very punctually at nine o'clock our hero requested of miss silence the honour of attending her home an evidence of discriminating taste which materially raised him in the estimation of that lady it was true to be sure that susan walked on the other side of him her little white hand just within his arm and there was something in that light touch that puzzled him unaccountably as might be inferred from the frequency with which miss silence was obliged to bring up the ends of conversation with what did you say what were you going to say and other persevering forms of inquiry with which a regular trained matter-of-fact talker will hunt down a poor fellow mortal who is in danger of sinking into a comfortable reverie when they parted at the gate however silence gave our hero a hearty invitation to come and see them any time which he mentally regarded as more to the point than anything else that had been said as joseph soberly retraced his way homeward his thoughts by some unaccountable association began to revert to such topics as the loneliness of man by himself the need of kindred spirits the solaces of sympathy and other like matters that night joseph dreamed of trotting along with his dinner basket to the old brown schoolhouse and vainly endeavouring to overtake susan jones whom he saw with her little pasteboard sunbonnet a few yards in front of him then he was teetering with her on a long board her bright little face glancing up and down while every curl around it seemed to be living with delight 
and then he was snowballing tom williams for knocking down susan's doll's house or he sat by her on a bench helping her out with a long sum in arithmetic but with the mischievous fatality of dreams the more he ciphered and expounded the longer and more hopeless grew the sum and he awoke in the morning shawing at his ill luck after having done a sum over half a dozen times while susan seemed to be looking on with the same air of arch drollery that he saw on her face the evening before joseph said uncle jaw the next morning at breakfast i suppose squire jones's daughters were not at the quilting yes sir they were said our hero they were both there why you don't say so they certainly were persisted the son well i thought the old gal had too much spunk for that you see there is a quarrel between the deacon and them gals indeed said joseph i thought the deacon never quarrelled with anybody but you see old silence there she will quarrel with him rally that creature is a tough one and uncle jaw leaned back in his chair and contemplated the quarrelsome propensities of miss silence with the satisfaction of a kindred spirit but i'll fix her yet he continued i see how to work it indeed father i did not know that you had anything to do with their affairs hain't i i should like to know if i hain't replied uncle jaw triumphantly now see here joseph you see i mean you shall be a lawyer i'm pretty considerable of a lawyer myself that is for one not college larnt and i'll tell you how it is and thereupon uncle jaw launched forth into the case of the meadow land and the mill and concluded with now joseph this here is a kinder whetstone for you to hone up your wits on in pursuance therefore of this plan of sharpening his wits in the manner aforesaid our hero after breakfast went like a dutiful son directly towards squire jones's doubtless for the purpose of taking ocular survey of the meadow-land mill and stone wall but by some unaccountable mistake lost his way and found himself standing before the door of squire jones's house the old squire had been among the aristocracy of the village and his house had been the ultimate standard of comparison in all matters of style and garniture their big front room instead of being strewn with lumps of sand duly streaked over twice a week was resplendent with a carpet of red yellow and black stripes while a towering pair of long-legged brass andirons scoured to a silvery white gave an air of magnificence to the chimney which was materially increased by the tall brass-headed shovel and tongs which like a decorous starched married couple stood bolt upright in their places on either side the sanctity of the place was still further maintained by keeping the window shutters always closed admitting only so much light as could come in by a round hole at the top of the shutter and it was only on occasions of extraordinary magnificence that the room was thrown open to profane eyes our hero was surprised therefore to find both the doors and windows of this apartment open and symptoms evident of its being in daily occupation the furniture still retained its massive clumsy stiffness but there were various tokens that lighter fingers had been at work there since the notable days of good dame jones there was a vase of flowers on the table two or three books of poetry and a little fairy work-basket from which peeped forth the edges of some worked ruffling there was a small writing-desk and last not least in a lady's collection an album with leaves of every colour of the rainbow containing inscriptions in sundry strong masculine hands to susan indicating that other people had had their eyes open as well as mr joseph adams so said he to himself this quiet little beauty has had admirers after all and consequent upon this came another question which was none of his concern to be sure whether the little lady were or were not engaged and from these speculations he was aroused by a light footstep and anon the neat form of susan made its appearance good morning miss jones said he bowing now there is something very comical in the feeling when little boys and girls who have always known each other as plain susan or joseph first meet as mr or miss so-and-so 
each one feels half disposed half afraid to return to the old familiar form and awkwardly fettered by the recollection that they are no longer children both parties had felt this the evening before when they met in company but now that they were alone together the feeling became still stronger and when susan had requested mr adams to take a chair and mr adams had inquired after miss susan's health there ensued a pause which the longer it continued seemed the more difficult to break and during which susan's pretty face slowly assumed an expression of the ludicrous till she was as near laughing as propriety would admit and mr adams having looked out at the window and up at the mantelpiece and down at the carpet at last looked at susan their eyes met the effect was electrical they both smiled and then laughed outright after which the whole difficulty of conversation vanished susan said joseph do you remember the old schoolhouse i thought that was what you were thinking of said susan but really you have grown and altered so that i could hardly believe my eyes last night nor i mine said joseph with a glance that gave a very complimentary turn to the expression our readers may imagine that after this the conversation proceeded to grow increasingly confidential and interesting that from the account of early life each proceeded to let the other know something of intervening history in the course of which each discovered a number of new and admirable traits in the other such things being matters of very common occurrence in the course of the conversation joseph discovered that it was necessary that susan should have two or three books then in his possession and as promptitude is a great matter in such cases he promised to bring them to-morrow for some time our young friends pursued their acquaintance without a distinct consciousness of anything except that it was a very pleasant thing to be together during the long still afternoons they rambled among the fading woods now illuminated with the radiance of the dying year and sentimentalized and quoted poetry and almost every evening joseph found some errand to bring him to the house a book for miss susan or a bundle of roots and herbs for miss silence or some remarkably fine yarn for her to knit attentions which retained our hero in the good graces of the latter lady and gained him the credit of being a young man that knew how to behave himself as susan was a leading member in the village choir our hero was directly attacked with a violent passion for sacred music which brought him punctually to the singing school where the young people came together to sing anthems and fuguing tunes and to eat apples and chestnuts it cannot be supposed that all these things passed unnoticed by those wakeful eyes that are ever upon the motions of such bright particular stars and as is usual in such cases many things were known to a certainty which were not yet known to the parties themselves the young bells and bow whispered and tittered and passed the original jokes and witticisms common in such cases while the old ladies soberly took the matter in hand when they went out with their knitting to make afternoon visits considering how much money uncle jaw had how much his son would have and what altogether would come to and whether joseph would be a smart man and susan a good housekeeper with all the ifs ands and buts of married life but the most fearful wonders and prognostics crowded around the point what uncle jaw would have to say to the matter his lawsuit with the sisters being well understood as there was every reason it should be it was surmised what two such vigorous belligerents as himself and miss silence would say to the prospect of a matrimonial conjunction it was also reported that deacon enos dudley had a claim to the land which constituted the finest part of susan's portion the loss of which would render the consent of uncle jaw still more doubtful but all this while miss silence knew nothing of the matter for her habit of considering and treating susan as a child seemed to gain strength with time susan was always to be seen to and watched and instructed and taught and miss silence could not conceive that one who could not even make pickles without her to oversee could think of such a matter as setting up housekeeping on her own account to be sure she began to observe an extraordinary change in her sister 
remarked that lately susan seemed to be getting sort of crazy-headed that she seemed not to have any faculty for anything that she had made gingerbread twice and forgot the ginger one time and put in mustard the other that she shook the salt cellar out in the tablecloth and let the cat into the pantry half a dozen times and that when scolded for these sins of omission or commission she had a fit of crying and did a little worse than before silence was of opinion that susan was getting to be weakly and narvy and actually concocted an unmerciful pitcher of wormwood and bone set which she said was to keep off the shaking weakness that was coming over her in vain poor susan protested that she was well enough miss silence knew better and one evening she entertained mr joseph adams with a long statement of the case in all its bearings and ended with demanding his opinion as a candid listener whether the wormwood and boneset sentence should not be executed poor susan had that very afternoon parted from a knot of young friends who had teased her most unmercifully on the score of attentions received till she began to think the very leaves and stones were so many eyes to pry into her secret feelings and then to have the whole case set in order before the very person too whom she most dreaded certainly he would think she was acting like a fool perhaps he did not mean anything more than friendship after all and she would not for the world have him suppose that she cared a copper more for him than for any other friend or that she was in love of all things so she sat very busy with her knitting work scarcely knowing what she was about till silence called out why susan what a piece of work you are making of that stocking heel what in the world are you doing to it susan dropped her knitting and making some pettish answer escaped out of the room now did you ever said silence laying down the seam she had been cross-stitching what is the matter with her mr adams miss susan is certainly indisposed replied our hero gravely i must get her to take your advice miss silence our hero followed susan to the front door where she stood looking out at the moon and begged to know what distressed her of course it was nothing the young lady's usual complaint when in low spirits and to show that she was perfectly easy she began an unsparing attack on a white rose-bush near by susan said joseph laying his hands on hers and in a tone that made her start she shook back her curls and looked up to him with such an innocent confiding face ah my good reader you may go on with this part of the story for yourself we are principled against unveiling the sacred mysteries the thoughts that breathe and words that burn in such little moonlight interviews as these you may fancy all that followed and we can only assure all who are doubtful that under judicious management cases of this kind may be disposed of without wormwood or bone set our hero and heroine were called to sublunary realities by the voice of miss silence who came into the passage to see what upon earth they were doing that lady was satisfied by the representations of so friendly and learned a young man as joseph that nothing immediately alarming was to be apprehended in the case of susan and she retired from that evening susan stepped about with a heart many pounds lighter than before i'll tell you what joseph said uncle jaw i'll tell you what now i hear em tell that you've took and courted that air susan jones now i just want to know if it's true there was an explicitness about this mode of inquiry that took our hero quite by surprise so that he could only reply why sir sir supposing i had would there be any objection to it in your mind don't talk to me said uncle jaw i just want to know if it's true our hero puts his hands in his pockets walked to the window and whistled cause if you have said uncle jaw you may just uncord as fast as you can for squire jones's daughter won't get a single cent of my money i can tell you that why father susan jones is not to blame for anything that her father did and i'm sure she is a pretty girl enough 
i don't care if she is pretty what's that to me i've got you through college joseph and a hard time i've had of it a delvin and slavin and here you come and the very first thing you do you must take and court that air squire jones's daughter who was always putting himself up above me besides i mean to have the law on that estate yet and deacon dudley he will have the law too and it will cut off the best piece of land the girl has and when you get married i mean you shall have something it's just a trick of them gals at me but i guess i'll come up with em yet i'm just a-goin down to have a regular hash with old silence to let her know she can't come round me that way silence said susan drawing her head into the window and looking apprehensive there's mr adams coming here what joe adams well and what if he is no no sister but it is his father it is uncle jaw well s'pose tis child what scares you s'pose i'm afraid of him if he wants more than i gave him last time i'll put it on so saying miss silence took her knitting work and marched down into the sitting-room and sat herself bolt upright in an attitude of defiance while poor susan feeling her heart beat unaccountably fast glided out of the room well good morning miss silence said uncle jaw after having scraped his feet on the scraper and scrubbed them on the mat nearly ten minutes in silent deliberation morning sir said silence abbreviating the good uncle jaw helped himself to a chair directly in front of the enemy dropped his hat on the floor and surveyed miss silence with a dogged air of satisfaction like one who is sitting down to a regular comfortable quarrel and means to make the most of it miss silence tossed her head disdainfully but scorned to commence hostilities End of chapter two part two chapter two part three of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter two love versus law part three so miss silence said uncle jaw deliberately you don't think you'll do anything about that air matter what matter said silence with an intonation resembling that of a roasted chestnut when it bursts from the fire i really thought miss silence in that air talk i had with you about squire jones's cheatin about that air mr adams said silence i tell you to begin with i'm not a-going to be sauced in this air way by you you hain't got common decency nor common sense nor common anything else to talk so to me about my father i won't bear it i tell you why miss jones said uncle jaw how you talk well to be sure squire jones is dead and gone and it's as well not to call it cheatin as i was tellin deacon enos when he was talking about that air lot that air lot you know that he sold the deacon and never let him have the deed on't that's a lie said silence starting on her feet that's an up and down black lie i tell you that now before you say another word miss silence rally you seem to be getting touchy said uncle jaw well to be sure if the deacon can let that pass other folks can and maybe the deacon will because squire jones was a church member and the deacon is maize and tender about bringing out anything against professors but rally now miss silence i didn't think you and susan were going to work it so cunning in this here way i don't know what you mean and what's more i don't care said silence resuming her work and calling back the bolt upright dignity with which she began there was a pause of some moments during which the features of silence worked with suppressed rage which was contemplated by uncle jaw with undisguised satisfaction you see i s'pose i shouldn't a minded your susan setting out to court up my joe if it hadn't a been for them things courting your son mr adams i should like to know what you mean by that i'm sure nobody wants your son though he's a civil likely fellow enough yet with such an old dragon for a father i'll warrant he won't get anybody to court him nor be courted by him neither 
rally miss silence you ain't hardly civil now civil i should like to know who could be civil you know now as well as i do that you are saying all this out of clear sheer ugliness and that's what you keep a doing all round the neighbourhood miss silence said uncle jaw i don't want no hard words with you it's pretty much known round the neighbourhood that your susan thinks she'll get my joe and i s'pose you was thinking that perhaps it would be the best way of settling up matters but you see now i took and telled my son i rally didn't see as i could afford it i took and telled him that young folks must have something considerable to start with and that if susan lost that air piece of ground as is likely she will it would be cutting off quite too much of a piece so you see i don't want you to take no encouragement about that well i think this is pretty well exclaimed silence provoked beyond measure or endurance you old torment think i don't know what you're at i and susan courting your son i wonder if you ain't ashamed of yourself now i should like to know what i or she have done now to get that notion into your head i didn't s'pose you spected to get him yourself said uncle jaw for i guess by this time you've pretty much gin up tryin hain't ye but susan does i'm pretty sure here susan susan you come down called miss silence in great wrath throwing open the chamber door mr adams wants to speak with you susan fluttering and agitated slowly descended into the room where she stopped and looked hesitatingly first at uncle jaw and then at her sister who without ceremony proposed the subject matter of the interview as follows now susan here's this man pretends to say that you've been according and snaring to get his son and i just want you to tell him that you hain't never had no thought of him and that you won't have neither this considerate way of announcing the subject had the effect of bringing the burning colour into susan's face as she stood like a convicted culprit with her eyes bent on the floor uncle jaw savage as he was was always moved by female loveliness as wild beasts are said to be mysteriously swayed by music and looked on the beautiful downcast face with more softening than miss silence who provoked that susan did not immediately respond to the question seized her by the arm and eagerly reiterated susan why don't you speak child gathering desperate courage susan shook off the hand of silence and straightened herself up with as much dignity as some little flower lifts up its head when it has been bent down by raindrops silence she said i never would have come down if i had thought it was to hear such things as this mr adams all i have to say to you is that your son has sought me and not i your son if you wish to know any more he can tell you better than i well i vow she is a pretty gal said uncle jaw as susan shut the door this exclamation was involuntary then recollecting himself he picked up his hat and saying well i guess i may as well get a long hum he began to depart but turning round before he shut the door he said miss silence if you should conclude to do anything about that air fence just send word over and let me know silence without deigning any reply marched up into susan's little chamber where our heroine was treating resolution to a good fit of crying susan i did not think you had been such a fool said the lady i do want to know now if you've rally been thinking of getting married and to that joe adams of all folks poor susan such an interlude in all her pretty romantic little dreams about kindred feelings and a hundred other delightful ideas that flutter like singing birds through the fairyland of first love such an interlude to be called on by gruff human voices to give up all the cherished secrets that she had trembled to whisper even to herself she felt as if love itself had been defiled by the coarse rough hands that had been meddling with it so to her sister's soothing address susan made no answer only to cry and sob still more bitterly than before 
miss silence if she had a great stout heart had no less a kind one and seeing susan take the matter so bitterly to heart she began gradually to subside susan you poor little fool you said she at the same time giving her a hearty slap as expressive of earnest sympathy i really do feel for you that good-for-nothing fellow has been a cheatin you i do believe oh don't talk any more about it for mercy's sake said susan i am sick of the whole of it that's you susan glad to hear you say so i'll stand up for you susan if i catch joe adams coming here again with his palavering face i'll let him know no no don't for mercy's sake say anything to mr adams don't well child don't claw hold of a body so well at any rate i'll just let joe adams know that we hain't nothing more to say to him but i don't wish to say that that is i don't know indeed sister silence don't say anything about it why not you ain't such a natural now as to want to marry him after all hey i don't know what i want nor what i don't want only silence do now if you love me do promise not to say anything at all to mr adams don't well then i won't said silence but susan if you rally was in love all this while why hain't you been and told me don't you know that i'm as much as a mother to you and you ought to have told me in the beginning i don't know silence i couldn't i don't want to talk about it well susan you ain't a bit like me said silence a remark evincing great discrimination certainly and with which the conversation terminated that very evening our friend joseph walked down towards the dwelling of the sisters not without some anxiety for the result for he knew by his father's satisfied appearance that war had been declared he walked into the family room and found nobody there but miss silence who was sitting grim as an egyptian sphinx stitching very vigorously on a meal bag in which interesting employment she thought proper to be so much engaged as not to remark the entrance of our hero to joseph's accustomed good evening miss silence she replied merely by looking up with a cold nod and went on with her sewing it appeared that she had determined on a literal version of her promise not to say anything to mr adams our hero as we have before stated was familiar with the crooks and turns of the female mind and mentally resolved to put a bold face on the matter and give miss silence no encouragement in her attempt to make him feel himself unwelcome it was rather a frosty autumnal evening and the fire on the hearth was decaying mr joseph bustled about most energetically throwing down the tongs and shovel and bellows while he pulled the fire to pieces raked out ashes and brands and then in a twinkling was at the woodpile from whence he selected a massive backlog and four stick with accompaniments which were soon roaring and crackling in the chimney there now that does look something like comfort said our hero and drawing forward the big rocking-chair he seated himself in it and rubbed his hands with an air of great complacency miss silence looked not up but stitched so much the faster so that one might distinctly hear the crack of the needle and the whistle of the thread all over the apartment have you a headache to-night miss silence no was the gruff answer are you in a hurry about those bags said he glancing at a pile of unmade ones which lay by her side no reply hang it all said our hero to himself i'll make her speak miss silence's needle-book and brown thread lay on a chair beside her our friend helped himself to a needle and thread and taking one of the bags planted himself bolt upright opposite to miss silence and pinning his work to his knee commenced stitching at a rate fully equal to her own miss silence looked up and fidgeted but went on with her work faster than before but the faster she worked the faster and steadier worked our hero all in marvellous silence there began to be an odd twitching about the muscles of miss silence's face our hero took no notice having pursed his features into an expression of unexampled gravity which only grew more intense as he perceived by certain uneasy movements that the adversary was beginning to waver 
as they were sitting stitching away their needles whizzing at each other like a couple of locomotives engaged in conversation susan opened the door the poor child had been crying for the greater part of her spare time during the day and was in no very merry humour but the moment that her astonished eyes comprehended the scene she burst into a fit of almost inextinguishable merriment while silence laid down her needle and looked half amused and half angry our hero however continued his business with inflexible perseverance unpinning his work and moving the seam along and going on with increased velocity poor miss silence was at length vanquished and joined in the loud laugh which seemed to convulse her sister whereupon our hero unpinned his work and folding it up looked up at her with all the assurance of impudence triumphant and remarked to susan your sister had such a pile of these pillow-cases to make that she was quite discouraged and engaged me to do half a dozen of them when i first came in she was so busy she could not even speak to me well if you ain't the beater for impudence said miss silence the beater for industry so i thought rejoined our hero susan who had been in a highly tragical state of mind all day and who was meditating on nothing less sublime than an eternal separation from her lover which she had imagined with all the affecting attendance and consequence was entirely revolutionized by the unexpected turn thus given to her ideas while our hero pursued the opportunity he had made for himself and exerted his powers of entertainment to the utmost till miss silence declaring that if she had been washing all day she should not have been more tired than she was with laughing took up her candle and good-naturedly left our young people to settle matters between themselves there was a grave pause of some length when she had departed which was broken by our hero who seating himself by susan inquired very seriously if his father had made proposals of marriage to miss silence that morning no you provoking creature said susan at the same time laughing at the absurdity of the idea well now don't draw on your long face again susan said joseph you have been trying to lengthen it down all the evening if i would have let you seriously now i know that something painful passed between my father and you this morning but i shall not inquire what it was i only tell you frankly that he has expressed his disapprobation of our engagement forbid me to go on with it and and consequently i release you from all engagements and obligations to me even before you ask it said susan you are extremely accommodating replied joseph but i cannot promise to be as obliging in giving up certain promises made to me unless indeed the feelings that dictated them should have changed oh no no indeed said susan earnestly you know it, it is not that but if your father objects to me if my father objects to you he is welcome not to marry you said joseph now joseph do be serious said susan well then seriously susan i know my obligations to my father and in all that relates to his comfort i will ever be dutiful and submissive for i have no college boy pride on the subject of submission but in a matter so individually my own as the choice of a wife in a matter that will most likely affect my happiness years and years after he has ceased to be i hold that i have a right to consult my own inclinations and by your leave my dear little lady i shall take that liberty but then if your father is made angry you know what sort of a man he is and how could i stand in the way of all your prospects why my dear susan do you think i count myself dependent upon my father like the heir of an english estate who has nothing to do but sit still and wait for money to come to him no i have energy and education to start with and if i cannot take care of myself and you too then cast me off and welcome and as joseph spoke his fine face glowed with a conscious power which unfettered youth never feels so fully as in america he paused a moment and resumed 
nevertheless susan i respect my father whatever others may say of him i shall never forget that i owe to his hard earnings the education that enables me to do or be anything and i shall not wantonly or rudely cross him i do not despair of gaining his consent my father has a great partiality for pretty girls and if his love of contradiction is not kept awake by open argument i will trust to time and you to bring him round but whatever comes rest assured my dearest one i have chosen for life and cannot change the conversation after this took a turn which may readily be imagined by all who have been in the same situation and will therefore need no further illustration well deacon raleigh i don't know what to think now there's my joe he's took and been according that air susan said uncle jaw this was the introduction to one of uncle jaw's periodical visits to deacon enos who was sitting with his usual air of mild abstraction looking into the coals of a bright november fire while his busy helpmate was industriously rattling her knitting needles by his side a close observer might have suspected that this was no news to the good deacon who had given a good deal of good advice in private to master joseph of late but he only relaxed his features into a quiet smile and ejaculated i want to know yes and raleigh deacon that air gal is a rail pretty un i was a tellin my folks that our new minister's wife was a fool to her and so your son is going to marry her said the good lady i knew that long ago well no not so fast ye see there's two to that bargain yet you see joe he never said a word to me but took and courted the gal out of his own head and when i come to know says i joe says i that air gal won't do for me and i took and telled him then about that air old fence and all about that old mill and them metters o mine and i telled him too about that air lot of susan's and i should like to know now deacon how that lot business is a-goin to turn out judge smith and squire mosley say that my claim to it will stand said the deacon they do said uncle jaw with much satisfaction s'pose then you'll sue won't you i don't know replied the deacon meditatively uncle jaw was thoroughly amazed that any one should have doubts about entering suit for a fine piece of land when sure of obtaining it was a problem quite beyond his powers of solving you say your son has courted the girl said the deacon after a long pause that strip of land is the best part of susan's share i paid down five hundred dollars on the nail for it i've got papers here that judge smith and squire mosley say will stand good in any court of law uncle jaw pricked up his ears and was all attention eyeing with eager looks the packet but to his disappointment the deacon deliberately laid it into his desk shut and locked it and resumed his seat now raleigh said uncle jaw i should like to know the particulars well well said the deacon the lawyers will be at my house to-morrow evening and if you have any concern about it you may as well come along uncle jaw wondered all the way home at what he could have done to get himself into the confidence of the old deacon who he rejoiced to think was a-going to take and go to law like other folks the next day there was an appearance of some bustle and preparation about the deacon's house the best room was opened and aired an oven full of cake was baked and our friend joseph with a face full of business was seen passing to and fro in and out of the house from various closetings with the deacon the deacon's lady bustled about the house with an air of wonderful mystery and even gave her directions about eggs and raisins in a whisper lest they should possibly let out some eventful secret the afternoon of that day joseph appeared at the house of the sisters stating that there was to be company at the deacon's that evening and he was sent to invite them why what's got into the deacon's folks lately said silence to have company so often joe adams this ere is some cut-up of yours come what are you up to now come come dress yourselves and get ready said joseph and stepping up to susan as she was following silence out of the room he whispered something into her ear at which she stopped short and coloured violently why joseph what do you mean it is so said he 
no no joseph no i can't indeed i can't but you can susan oh joseph don't oh susan do why how strange joseph come come my dear you keep me waiting if you have any objections on the score of propriety we will talk about them to-morrow and our hero looked so saucy and so resolute that there was no disputing further so after a little more lingering and blushing on susan's part and a few kisses and persuasions on the part of the suitor miss susan seemed to be brought to a state of resignation at a table in the middle of uncle enos's north front room were seated the two lawyers whose legal opinion was that evening to be fully made up the younger of these squire mosley was a rosy portly laughing little bachelor who boasted that he had offered himself in rotation to every pretty girl within twenty miles round and among others to susan jones notwithstanding which he still remained a bachelor with a fair prospect of being an old one but none of these things disturbed the boundless flow of good-nature and complacency with which he seemed at all times full to overflowing on the present occasion he appeared to be particularly in his element as if he had some law business in hand remarkably suited to his turn of mind for on finishing the inspection of the papers he started up slapped his graver brother on the back made two or three flourishes round the room and then seizing the old deacon's hand shook it violently exclaiming all's right deacon all's right go it go it hurrah when uncle jaw entered the deacon without preface handed him a chair and the papers saying these papers are what you wanted to see i just wish you would read them over uncle jaw read them deliberately over didn't i tell ye so deacon the case is as clear as a bell now you will go to law won't you look here mr adams now you have seen these papers and heard what's to be said i'll make you an offer let your son marry susan jones and i'll burn these papers and say no more about it and there won't be a girl in the parish with a finer portion uncle jaw opened his eyes with amazement and looked at the old man his mouth gradually expanding wider and wider as if he hoped in time to swallow the idea well now i swan at length he ejaculated i mean just as i say said the deacon why that's the same as giving the gal five hundred dollars out of your own pocket and she ain't no relation neither i know it said the deacon but i have said i will do it what upon arth for said uncle jaw to make peace said the deacon and to let you know that when i say it is better to give up one's rights than to quarrel i mean so i am an old man my children are dead his voice faltered my treasures are laid up in heaven if i can make the children happy why i will when i thought i had lost the land i made up my mind to lose it and so i can now uncle jaw looked fixedly on the old deacon and said well deacon i believe you i vow if you hain't got something ahead in t'other world i'd like to know who has that's all so if joe has no objections and i rather guess he won't have the short of the matter is said the squire we'll have a wedding so come on and with that he threw open the parlour door where stood susan and joseph in a recess by the window while silence and the rev mr bissell were drawn up by the fire and the deacon's lady was sweeping up the hearth as she had been doing ever since the party arrived instantly joseph took the hand of susan and led her to the middle of the room the merry squire seized the hand of miss silence and placed her as bridesmaid and before any one knew what they were about the ceremony was in actual progress and the minister having been previously instructed made the two one with extraordinary celerity what 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 said uncle jaw joseph deacon fair bargain sir said the squire hand over your papers deacon the deacon handed them and the squire having read them aloud proceeded with much ceremony to throw them into the fire after which in a mock solemn oration he gave a statement of the whole affair and concluded with a grave exhortation to the new couple on the duties of wedlock 
which unbent the risibles even of the minister himself uncle jaw looked at his pretty daughter-in-law who stood half smiling half blushing receiving the congratulations of the party and then at miss silence who appeared full as much taken by surprise as himself well well miss silence these ere young folks have come round us slick enough said he i don't see but we must shake hands upon it and the warlike powers shook hands accordingly which was a signal for general merriment as the company were dispersing miss silence laid hold of the good deacon and by main strength dragged him aside deacon said she i take back all that e'er i said about you every word aunt don't say any more about it miss silence said the good man it's gone by and let it go joseph said his father the next morning as he was sitting at breakfast with joseph and susan i calculate i shall feel kinder proud of this ere gal and i'll tell you what i'll just give you that nice little delicate stanton place that i took on stanton's mortgage it's a nice little place with green blinds and flowers and all them things just right for susan and accordingly many happy years flew over the heads of the young couple in the stanton place long after the hoary hairs of their kind benefactor the deacon were laid with reverence in the dust uncle jaw was so far wrought upon by the magnanimity of the good old man as to be very materially changed for the better instead of quarrelling in real earnest all around the neighbourhood he confined himself merely to battling the opposite side of every question with his son which as the latter was somewhat of a logician afforded a pretty good field for the exercise of his powers and he was heard to declare at the funeral of the old deacon that after all a man got as much and may be more to go along as the deacon did than to be all the time fisting and jawing though i tell you what it is said he afterwards taint every one that has the deacon's faculty anyhow end of chapter two part three chapter three of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the may flower and miscellaneous writings chapter three the tea rose there it stood in its little green vase on a light ebony stand in the window of the drawing-room the rich satin curtains with their costly fringes swept down on either side of it and around it glittered every rare and fanciful trifle which wealth can offer to luxury and yet that simple rose was the fairest of them all so pure it looked its white leaves just touched with that delicious creamy tint peculiar to its kind its cup so full so perfect its head bending as if it were sinking and melting away in its own richness oh when did ever man make anything to equal the living perfect flower but the sunlight that streamed through the window revealed something fairer than the rose reclined on an ottoman in a deep recess and intently engaged with a book rested what seemed the counterpart of that so lovely flower that cheek so pale that fair forehead so spiritual that countenance so full of high thought those long downcast lashes and the expression of the beautiful mouth sorrowful yet subdued and sweet it seemed like the picture of a dream florence florence echoed a merry and musical voice in a sweet impatient tone turn your head reader and you will see a light and sparkling maiden the very model of some little wilful elf born of mischief and motion with a dancing eye a foot that scarcely seems to touch the carpet and a smile so multiplied with dimples that it seems like a thousand smiles at once come florence i say said the little sprite put down that wise good and excellent volume and descend from your cloud and talk with a poor little mortal the fair apparition thus adjured obeyed and looking up 
revealed just such eyes as you expected to see beneath such lids eyes deep pathetic and rich as a strain of sad music i say cousin said the bright lady i have been thinking what you are to do with your pet rose when you go to new york as to our consternation you are determined to do you know it would be a sad pity to leave it with such a scatterbrain as i am i do love flowers that is a fact that is i like a regular bouquet cut off and tied up to carry to a party but as to all this tending and fussing which is needful to keep them growing i have no gifts in that line make yourself easy as to that kate said florence with a smile i have no intention of calling upon your talents i have an asylum in view for my favourite oh then you know just what i was going to say mrs marshall i presume has been speaking to you she was here yesterday and i was quite pathetic upon the subject telling her the loss your favourite would sustain and so forth and she said how delighted she would be to have it in her greenhouse it is in such a fine state now so full of buds i told her i knew you would like to give it to her you are so fond of mrs marshall you know now kate i am sorry but i have otherwise engaged it whom can it be to you have so few intimates here oh it is only one of my odd fancies but do tell me florence well cousin you know the little pale girl to whom we give sewing what little mary stevens how absurd florence this is just another of your motherly old maidish ways dressing dolls for poor children making bonnets and knitting socks for all the little dirty babies in the region round about i do believe you have made more calls in those two vile ill-smelling alleys back of our house than ever you have in chestnut street though you know everybody is half dying to see you and now to crown all you must give this choice little bijou to a seamstress girl when one of your most intimate friends in your own class would value it so highly what in the world can people in their circumstances want of flowers just the same as i do replied florence calmly have you not noticed that the little girl never comes here without looking wistfully at the opening buds and don't you remember the other morning she asked me so prettily if i would let her mother come and see it she was so fond of flowers but florence only think of this rare flower standing on a table with ham eggs cheese and flour and stifled in that close little room where mrs stevens and her daughter manage to wash iron cook and nobody knows what besides well kate and if i were obliged to live in one coarse room and wash and iron and cook as you say if i had to spend every moment of my time in toil with no prospect from my window but a brick wall and a dirty lane such a flower as this would be untold enjoyment for me pshaw florence all sentiment poor people have no time to be sentimental besides i don't believe it will grow with them it is a greenhouse flower and used to delicate living oh as to that a flower never inquires whether its owner is rich or poor and mrs stevens whatever else she has not has sunshine of as good quality as this that streams through our window the beautiful things that god makes are his gift to all alike you will see that my fair rose will be as well and cheerful in mrs stevens's room as in ours well after all how odd when one gives to poor people one wants to give them something useful a bushel of potatoes a ham and such things why certainly potatoes and ham must be supplied but having ministered to the first and most craving wants why not add any other little pleasures or gratifications we may have it in our power to bestow i know there are many of the poor who have fine feeling and a keen sense of the beautiful which rusts out and dies because they are too hard pressed to procure it any gratification poor mrs stevens for example i know she would enjoy birds and flowers and music as much as i do 
i have seen her eye light up as she looked on these things in our drawing-room and yet not one beautiful thing can she command from necessity her room her clothing all she has must be coarse and plain you should have seen the almost rapture she and mary felt when i offered them my rose dear me all this may be true but i never thought of it before i never thought that these hard-working people had any ideas of taste then why do you see the geranium or rose so carefully nursed in the old cracked teapot in the poorest room or the morning glory planted in a box and twined about the window do not this show that the human heart yearns for the beautiful in all ranks of life you remember kate how our washerwoman sat up a whole night after a hard day's work to make her first bibby a pretty dress to be baptized in yes and i remember how i laughed at you for making such a tasteful little cap for it well katie i think the look of perfect delight with which the poor mother regarded her baby in its new dress and cap was something quite worth creating i do believe she could not have felt more grateful if i had sent her a barrel of flour well i never thought before of giving anything to the poor but what they really needed and i have always been willing to do that when i could without going far out of my way well cousin if our heavenly father gave to us after this mode we should have only coarse shapeless piles of provisions lying about the world instead of all this beautiful variety of trees and fruits and flowers well well cousin i suppose you are right but have mercy on my poor head it is too small to hold so many new ideas all at once so go on your own way and the little lady began practising a waltzing step before the glass with great satisfaction it was a very small room lighted by only one window there was no carpet on the floor there was a clean but coarsely covered bed in one corner a cupboard with a few dishes and plates in the other a chest of drawers and before the window stood a small cherry stand quite new and indeed it was the only article in the room that seemed so a pale sickly-looking woman of about forty was leaning back in her rocking-chair her eyes closed and her lips compressed as if in pain she rocked backward and forward a few minutes pressed her hand hard upon her eyes and then languidly resumed her fine stitching on which she had been busy since morning the door opened and a slender little girl of about twelve years of age entered her large blue eyes dilated and radiant with delight as she bore in the vase with the rose tree in it oh see mother see here is one in full bloom and two more half out and ever so many more pretty buds peeping out of the green leaves the poor woman's face brightened as she looked first on the rose and then on her sickly child on whose face she had not seen so bright a colour for months god bless her she exclaimed unconsciously miss florence yes i knew you would feel so mother does it not make your head feel better to see such a beautiful flower now will you not look so longingly at the flowers in the market for we have a rose that is handsomer than any of them why it seems to me it is worth as much to us as our whole garden used to be only see how many buds there are just count them and only smell the flower now where shall we set it up and mary skipped about placing her flower first in one position and then in another and walking off to see the effect till her mother gently reminded her that the rose tree could not preserve its beauty without sunlight oh yes truly said mary well then it must stand here on our new stand how glad i am that we have such a handsome new stand for it it will look so much better and mrs stevens laid down her work and folded a piece of newspaper on which the treasure was duly deposited there said mary watching the arrangement eagerly that will do no for it does not show both the opening buds a little farther around a little more there that is right and then mary walked around to view the rose in various positions after which she urged her mother to go with her to the outside and see how it looked from there 
how kind it was in miss florence to think of giving this to us said mary though she had done so much for us and given us so many things yet this seems the best of all because it seems as if she thought of us and knew just how we felt and so few do that you know mother what a bright afternoon that little gift made in that little room how much faster mary's fingers flew in the live-long day as she sat sewing by her mother and mrs stevens in the happiness of her child almost forgot that she had a headache and thought as she sipped her evening cup of tea that she felt stronger than she had done for some time that rose its sweet influence died not with the first day through all the long cold winter the watching tending cherishing that flower awakened a thousand pleasant trains of thought that beguiled the sameness and weariness of their life every day the fair growing thing put forth some fresh beauty a leaf a bud a new shoot and constantly awakened the fresh enjoyment in its possessors as it stood in the window the passer-by would sometimes stop and gaze attracted by its beauty and then proud and happy was mary nor did even the serious and careworn widow notice with indifference this tribute to the beauty of their favorite but little did florence think when she bestowed the gift that there twined about it an invisible thread that reached far and brightly into the web of her destiny one cold afternoon in early spring a tall and graceful gentleman called at the lowly room to pay for the making of some linen by the inmates he was a stranger and wayfarer recommended through the charity of some of mrs stevens patrons as he turned to go his eye rested admiringly on the rose tree and he stopped to gaze at it how beautiful said he yes said little mary and it was given to us by a lady as sweet and beautiful as that is ah said the stranger turning upon her a pair of bright dark eyes pleased and rather struck by the communication and how came she to give it to you my little girl oh because we are poor and mother is sick and we never can have anything pretty we used to have a garden once and we loved flowers so much and miss florence found it out and so she gave us this florence echoed the stranger yes miss florence lestrange a beautiful lady they say she was from foreign parts but she speaks english just like other ladies only sweeter is she here now is she in this city said the gentleman eagerly no she left some months ago said the widow noticing the shade of disappointment on his face but said she you can find all about her at her aunt's mrs carlyle's number ten blank street a short time after florence received a letter in a handwriting that made her tremble during the many early years of her life spent in france she had well learned to know that writing had loved as a woman like her loves only once but there had been obstacles of parents and friends long separation long suspense till after anxious years she had believed the ocean had closed over that hand and heart and it was this that had touched with such pensive sorrow the lines in her lovely face but this letter told her that he was living that he had traced her even as a hidden streamlet may be traced by the freshness the verdure of heart which her deeds of kindness had left wherever she had passed thus much said our reader needs no help in finishing my story for themselves end of chapter three the tea rose Chapter 7 of The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 4 Trials of a Housekeeper 
i have a detail of very homely grievances to present but such as they are many a heart will feel them to be heavy the trials of a housekeeper pooh says one of the lords of creation taking his cigar out of his mouth and twirling it between his two first fingers what a fuss these women do make of this simple matter of managing a family i can't see for the life as there is anything so extraordinary to be done in this matter of housekeeping only three meals a day to be got and cleared off and it really seems to take up the whole of their mind from morning till night i could keep house without so much of a flurry i know now prithee good brother listen to my story and see how much you know about it i came to this enlightened west about a year since and was duly established in a comfortable country residence within a mile and a half of the city and there commenced the enjoyment of domestic felicity i had been married about three months and had been previously in love in the most approved romantic way with all the proprieties of moonlight walks serenades sentimental billets doux and everlasting attachment after having been allowed as i said about three months to get over this sort of thing and to prepare for realities i was located for life as aforesaid my family consisted of myself and husband a female friend as a visitor and two brothers of my good man who were engaged with him in business i pass over the two or three first days spent in that process of hammering boxes breaking crockery knocking things down and picking them up again which is commonly called getting to housekeeping as usual carpets were sewed and stretched laid down and then taken up to be sewed over things were formed and reformed transformed and conformed till at last a settled order began to appear but now came up the great point of all during our confusion we had cooked and eaten our meals in a very miscellaneous and pastoral manner eating now from the top of a barrel and now from a fireboard laid on two chairs and drinking some from teacups and some from saucers and some from tumblers and some from a pitcher big enough to be drowned in and sleeping some on sofas and some on straggling beds and mattresses thrown down here and there wherever there was room all these pleasant barbarities were now at an end the house was in order the dishes put up in their places three regular meals were to be administered in one day all in an orderly civilized form beds were to be made rooms swept and dusted dishes washed knives scoured and all the etc to be attended to now for getting help as mrs trollope says and where and how were we to get it we knew very few persons in the city and how were we to accomplish the matter at length the house of employment was mentioned and my husband was dispatched thither regularly every day for a week while i in the meantime was very nearly dispatched by the abundance of work at home at length one evening as i was sitting completely exhausted thinking of resorting to the last feminine expedient for supporting life viz a good fit of crying my husband made his appearance with a most triumphant air at the door there margaret i have got you a couple at last cook and chambermaid so saying he flourished open the door and gave to my view the picture of a little dry snuffy-looking old woman and a great staring dutch girl in a green bonnet with red ribbons with wide mouth open and hands and feet that would have made a greek sculptor open his mouth too i addressed forthwith a few words of encouragement to each of this cultivated-looking couple and proceeded to ask their names and forthwith the old woman began to snuffle and to wipe her face with what was left of an old silk pocket-handkerchief preparatory to speaking while the young lady opened her mouth wider and looked around with a frightened air as if meditating an escape after some preliminaries however i found out that my old woman was mrs tibbins and my hebby's name was cotterin also that she knew much more dutch than english and not any too much of either the old lady was the cook i ventured a few inquiries has she ever cooked yes ma'am sartin she had lived at two or three places in the city i suspect my dear said my husband confidently that she is an experienced cook and so your troubles are over and he went to reading his newspaper i said no more but determined to wait till morning the breakfast to be sure did not do much honour to the talents of my official but it was the first time and the place was new to her 
after breakfast was cleared away i proceeded to give directions for dinner it was merely a plain joint of meat i said to be roasted in the tin oven the experienced cook looked at me with a stare of entire vacuity the tin oven i repeated stands there pointing to it she walked up to it and touched it with such an appearance of suspicion as if it had been an electrical battery and then looked round at me with a look of such helpless ignorance that my soul was moved i never seen one of them tanks before said she never saw a tin oven i exclaimed i thought you said you had cooked in two or three families they does not have such things in them though rejoined my old lady nothing was to be done of course but to instruct her in the philosophy of the case and having split the joint and given numberless directions i walked off to my room to superintend the operations of cotterin to whom i had committed the making of my bed and the sweeping of my room it never having come into my head that there could be a wrong way of making a bed and to this day it is a marvel to me how any one could arrange pillows and quilts to make such a nondescript appearance as mine now presented one glance showed me that catherine also was just caught and that i had as much to do in her department as in that of my old lady just then the doorbell rang oh there is the doorbell i exclaimed run catherine and show them into the parlor catherine started to run as directed and then stopped and stood looking round on all the doors and on me with a woefully puzzled air the street door said i pointing toward the entry Cotterin blundered into the entry and stood gazing with a look of stupid wonder at the bell ringing without hands while i went to the door and let in the company before she could be fairly made to understand the connection between the ringing and the phenomenon of admission as dinner time approached i sent word into my kitchen to have it set on but recollecting the state of the heads of department there i soon followed my own orders I found the tin oven standing out in the middle of the kitchen, and my cook seated a la Turk in front of it, contemplating the roast meat with full as puzzled an air as in the morning. I once more explained the mystery of taking it off, and assisted her to get it on to a platter, though somewhat cooled by having been so long set out for inspection. I was standing holding the spit in my hands when Cotterin, who had heard the doorbell ring and was determined this time to be in season, ran into the hall and soon returning opened the kitchen door and politely ushered in three or four fashionable looking ladies, exclaiming, Here she is! As these were strangers from the city who had come to make their first call, this introduction was far from proving an eligible one the look of thunderstruck astonishment with which i greeted their first appearance as i stood brandishing the spit and the terrified snuffling and staring of poor mrs tibbins who again had recourse to her old pocket-handkerchief almost entirely vanquished their gravity and it was evident that they were on the point of a broad laugh so recovering my self-possession i apologized and led the way to the parlour let these few incidents be a specimen of the four mortal weeks that i spent with these helps during which time i did almost as much work with twice as much anxiety as when there was nobody there and yet everything went wrong besides the young gentlemen complained of the patches of starch grimed to their collars and the streaks of black coal ironed into their dickies while one week every pocket-handkerchief in the house was starched so stiff you might as well have carried an earthen plate in your pocket the tumblers looked muddy the plates were never washed clean or wiped dry unless i attended to each one and as to eating and drinking we experienced a variety that we had not before considered possible at length the old woman vanished from the stage and was succeeded by a knowing active capable damsel with a temper like a steel trap who remained with me just one week and then went off in a fit of spite to her succeeded a rosy good-natured merry lass who broke the crockery burned the dinner tore the clothes in ironing and knocked down everything that stood in her way about the house without at all discomposing herself about the matter one night she took the stopper from a barrel of molasses and came singing off upstairs while the molasses ran soberly out into the cellar bottom all night till by morning it was in a state of universal emancipation having done this and also dispatched an entire set of tea things by letting the waiter fall she one day made her disappearance 
then for a wonder there fell to my lot a tidy efficient trained english girl pretty and genteel and neat and knowing how to do everything and with the sweetest temper in the world now said i to myself i shall rest from my labours everything about the house began to go right and looked as clean and genteel as mary's own pretty self but alas this period of repose was interrupted by the vision of a clever trim-looking young man who for some weeks could be heard scraping his boots at the kitchen door every sunday night and at last miss mary with some smiling and blushing gave me to understand that she must leave in two weeks why mary said i feeling a little mischievous don't you like the place oh yes ma'am then why do you look after another i am not going to another place what mary are you going to learn a trade no ma'am why then what do you mean to do i expect to keep house myself ma'am she said laughing and blushing oh ho said i that is it and so in two weeks i lost the best little girl in the world peace to her memory after this came an interregnum which put me in mind of the chapter in chronicles that i used to read with great delight when a child where basha and elah and tibni and zimri and omri one after the other came on to the throne of israel all in the compass of a half a dozen verses we had one old woman who stayed a week and went away with the misery in her tooth one young woman who ran away and got married one cook who came at night and went off before light in the morning one very clever girl who stayed a month and then went away because her mother was sick another who stayed six weeks and was taken with the fever herself and during all this time who can speak the damage and destruction wrought in the domestic paraphernalia by passing through these multiplied hands what shall we do shall we give up houses have no furniture to take care of keep merely a bag of meal a porridge pot and a pudding stick and sit in our tent door in real patriarchal independence what shall we do this ends chapter four the trials of a housekeeper chapter five of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter five little edward were any of you born in new england in the good old catechizing church-going school-going orderly times if so you may have seen my uncle abel the most perpendicular rectangular upright downright good man that ever laboured six days and rested on the seventh you remember his hard weather-beaten countenance where every line seemed drawn with a pen of iron and the point of a diamond his considerate grey eyes that moved over objects as if it were not best to be in a hurry about seeing the circumspect opening and shutting of the mouth his down sitting and uprising all performed with conviction of forethought in short the whole ordering of his life and conversation which was according to the tenor of the military order to the right about face forward march now if you supposed from all this triangularism of exterior that this good man had nothing kindly within you were much mistaken you often find the greenest grass under a snowdrift and though my uncle's mind was not exactly of the flower garden kind still there was an abundance of wholesome and kindly vegetation there it is true he seldom laughed and never joked himself but no man had a more serious and weighty conviction of what a good joke was in another and when some exceeding witticism was dispensed in his presence you might see uncle abel's face slowly relax into an expression of solemn satisfaction and he would look at the author with a sort of quiet wonder as if it was past his comprehension how such a thing could ever come into a man's head uncle abel too had some relish for the fine arts 
in proof of which i might adduce the pleasure with which he gazed at the plates in his family bible the likeness whereof is neither in heaven nor on earth nor under the earth and he was also such an eminent musician that he could go through the singing-book at one sitting without the least fatigue beating time like a windmill all the way he had too a liberal hand though his liberality was all by the rule of three he did by his neighbour exactly as he would be done by he loved some things in this world very sincerely he loved his god much but he honoured and feared him more he was exact with others he was more exact with himself and he expected his god to be more exact still everything in uncle abel's house was in the same time place manner and form from year's end to year's end there was old master bows a dog after my uncle's own heart who always walked as if he was studying the multiplication table there was the old clock forever ticking in the kitchen corner with a picture on its face of the sun forever setting behind a perpendicular row of poplar trees there was the never-failing supply of red peppers and onions hanging over the chimney there too were the yearly hollyhocks and morning glories blooming about the windows there was the best room with its sanded floor the cupboard in one corner with its glass doors the evergreen asparagus bushes in the chimney and there was the stand with the bible and almanac on it in another corner there too was aunt betsy who never looked any older because she always looked as old as she could who always dried her catnip and wormwood the last of september and began to clean house the first of may in short this was the land of continuance old time never took it into his head to practise either addition or subtraction or multiplication on its sum total this aunt betsy aforenamed was the neatest and most efficient piece of human machinery that ever operated in forty places at once she was always everywhere predominating over and seeing to everything and though my uncle had been twice married aunt betsy's rule and authority had never been broken she reigned over his wives when living and reigned after them when dead and so seemed likely to reign on to the end of the chapter but my uncle's latest wife left aunt betsy a much less tractable subject than ever before had fallen to her lot little edward was the child of my uncle's old age and a brighter merrier little blossom never grew on the verge of an avalanche he had been committed to the nursing of his grandmamma till he had arrived at the age of indiscretion and then my old uncle's heart so yearned for him that he was sent for home his introduction into the family excited a terrible sensation never was there such a condemner of dignity such a violator of high places and sanctities as this very master edward it was all in vain to try to teach him decorum he was the most outrageously merry elf that ever shook a head of curls and it was all the same to him whether it was sabbath day or any other day he laughed and frolicked with everybody and everything that came in his way not even excepting his solemn old father and when you saw him with his fair arms around the old man's neck and his bright blue eyes and blooming cheek peering out beside the bleak face of uncle abel you might fancy you saw spring caressing winter uncle abel's metaphysics were sorely puzzled by this sparkling dancing compound of spirit and matter nor could he devise any method of bringing it into any reasonable shape for he did mischief with an energy and perseverance that was truly astonishing once he scoured the floor with aunt betsy's very scotch snuff once he washed up the hearth with uncle abel's most immaculate clothes-brush and once he was found trying to make bows wear his father's spectacles in short there was no use except the right one to which he did not put everything that came in his way but uncle abel was most of all puzzled to know what to do with him on the sabbath for on that day master edward seemed to exert himself to be particularly diligent and entertaining edward 
edward must not play sunday his father would call out and then edward would hold up his curly head and look as grave as the catechism but in three minutes you would see pussy scampering through the best room with edward at her heels to the entire discomposure of all devotion in aunt betsy and all others in authority at length my uncle came to the conclusion that it wasn't in nature to teach him any better and that he could no more keep sunday than the brook down in the lot my poor uncle he did not know what was the matter with his heart but certain it was he lost all faculty of scolding when little edward was in the case and he would rub his spectacles a quarter of an hour longer than common when aunt betsy was detailing his witticisms and clever doings in process of time our hero had compassed his third year and arrived at the dignity of going to school he went illustriously through the spelling-book and then attacked the catechism went from man's chief end to the requirings and forbiddens in a fortnight and at last came home inordinately merry to tell his father that he had got to amen after this he made a regular business of saying over the whole every sunday evening standing with his hands folded in front and his checked apron folded down occasionally glancing round to see if pussy gave proper attention and being of a practically benevolent turn of mind he made several commendable efforts to teach bows the catechism in which he succeeded as well as might be expected in short without further detail master edward bade fair to become a literary wonder but alas for poor little edward his merry dance was soon over a day came when he sickened aunt betsy tried her whole herbarium but in vain he grew rapidly worse and worse his father sickened in heart but said nothing he only stayed by his bedside day and night trying all means to save with affecting pertinacity can't you think of anything more doctor said he to the physician when all had been tried in vain nothing answered the physician a momentary convulsion passed over my uncle's face the will of the lord be done said he almost with a groan of anguish just at that moment a ray of the setting sun pierced the checked curtains and gleamed like an angel's smile across the face of the little sufferer he woke from troubled sleep oh dear i am so sick he gasped feebly his father raised him in his arms he breathed easier and looked up with a grateful smile just then his old playmate the cat crossed the room there goes pussy said he oh dear i shall never play any more at that moment a deadly change passed over his face he looked up in his father's face with an imploring expression and put out his hand as if for help there was one moment of agony and then the sweet features all settled into a smile of peace and mortality was swallowed up of life my uncle laid him down and looked one moment at his beautiful face it was too much for his principles too much for his consistency and he lifted up his voice and wept the next morning was the sabbath the funeral day and it rose with breath all incense and with cheek all bloom uncle abel was as calm and collected as ever but in his face there was a sorrow-stricken appearance touching to behold i remember him at family prayers as he bent over the great bible and began the psalm lord thou hast been our dwelling-place in all generations apparently he was touched by the melancholy splendour of the poetry for after reading a few verses he stopped there was a dead silence interrupted only by the tick of the clock he cleared his voice repeatedly and tried to go on but in vain he closed the book and kneeled down to prayer the energy of sorrow broke through his usual formal reverence and his language flowed forth with a deep and sorrowful pathos which i shall never forget the god so much reverenced so much feared seemed to draw near to him as a friend and comforter his refuge and strength a very present help in time of trouble my uncle rose and i saw him walk to the room of the departed one he uncovered the face 
it was set with the seal of death but oh how surpassingly lovely the brilliancy of life was gone but that pure transparent face was touched with a mysterious triumphant brightness which seemed like the dawning of heaven my uncle looked long and earnestly he felt the beauty of what he gazed on his heart was softened but he had no words for his feelings he left the room unconsciously and stood in the front door the morning was bright the bells were ringing for church the birds were singing merrily and the pet squirrel of little edward was frolicking about the door my uncle watched him as he ran first up one tree and then down and up another and then over the fence whisking his brush and chattering just as if nothing was the matter with a deep sigh uncle abel broke forth how happy that creature is well the lord's will be done that day the dust was committed to dust amid the lamentations of all who had known little edward years have passed since then and all that is mortal of my uncle has long since been gathered to his fathers but his just and upright spirit has entered the glorious liberty of the sons of god yes the good man may have had opinions which the philosophical scorn weaknesses at which the thoughtless smile but death shall change him into all that is enlightened wise and refined for he shall awake in his likeness and be satisfied End of chapter five